Throughout this unit, we've talked a lot about trends and patterns. Some of those trends and patterns we saw are valence electrons, they are group numbers, period numbers, main energy levels, sublevels, and it all depended on the placement of these elements. And this is all based on the periodic law. When elements are placed in order of increasing atomic number, they show a repetition in their chemical and physical properties. Today we're going to talk about five of those chemical and physical properties, but before we get there, let's talk about the two variables that we looked at last class. The two variables determine the periodic trends that we're talking about today. The first one is the force of attraction. So this is the attraction between the nucleus and the valence electrons. Remember that the nucleus is a positively charged nucleus, while the valence electrons, the electrons, are negatively charged. So we're really talking about the attraction between the nucleus and the valence electrons, the outer electrons. Remember, we're focusing on the valence electrons because those are the electrons that are involved with bonding and reactions. Now, there is the attraction between the inner electrons and the nucleus, and there's also the repulsion between the electrons. Um, it does play into the properties that we talk about today, but, but our main focus is looking at the overall attraction between the nucleus and, its, and the valence electrons. The second variable we'll talk about is distance. So remember that as you go down the periodic table and you go from period one to period two to all the way down to seven, what's happening in the atom is that you're adding more energy levels, right? So period one would have one main energy level period six would have six main energy levels around the nucleus. And these are the two variables that you guys looked at in the activity uh, last class. And I showed you four different models and you basically determined the relationship between um, the independent variable and dependent variable in each of the models. The first two models had to do with the distance and the force of attraction. And you guys said that the greater the distance that the electron is from the nucleus, the force of attraction on an electron decreases. So here we have an inverse relationship, right? An opposite relationship. And this refers to the different energy levels. So this one is model two, where if the valence electron is further away from the nucleus, then the force of attraction on an electron decreases. Now also think about what's happening as you add more energy levels. Remember that each energy level also contains its electrons, right? So on the first energy level, we have two electrons, a total of two electrons. On the second energy level, we have a total of eight valence electrons. Third energy level, a total of eight valence electrons, and et cetera, et cetera. And as you have more of those energy levels, and you, as you have more of those electrons, the inner core electrons, well, think about what it's doing to the attraction, the force of attraction between the nucleus and the valence electrons. It's actually shielding the attractive force that the nucleus has on its valence electrons. So the more energy levels an atom has, the more shields there are, and so the weaker the attractive force. In models three and four, you guys looked at uh, what happens as an atom increases the number of protons, and you saw that the more protons, the greater the force of attraction on an electron. So think about um, as you go left to right across the periodic table or across a period, what's happening to the number of protons in the nucleus? You're gaining more protons, right? Atomic number tells you the number of protons. So what happens when you gain more protons? Well, the positive charge is getting stronger. So what's going to happen as the positive charge uh, is, gets stronger? The force of attraction to its valence electrons are also going to get stronger, right? And think about it. As you increase the number of protons, yes, you are also increasing the number of electrons. However, if you think about the main energy level, 
what's happening to the main energy level as you go across the period. You're not changing energy levels, you're on the same main energy level. And even though you are increasing the number of electrons, because they are on the same energy level, meaning the same distance away from the nucleus as you go left to right on, on the periodic table, you're not gaining more quote unquote shields to uh, shield the attraction that the nucleus has on the valence electrons. So the more protons you have, the stronger the positive charge, the stronger the positive charge, the more for, the more attraction it has on its valence electrons. So if you take a look at this model four, sodium has 11 protons and 11 electrons. Aluminum has 13 protons and 13 electrons, and chlorine has 17 protons and 17 electrons. And as you go left to right, you can see that the distance is the same, right? The distance of the valence electrons from the nucleus is exactly the same. Um, the only thing that's really changing is the positive charge in the nucleus. And so as you gain more protons, the stronger the attraction uh, the nucleus has on its valence electrons. So now that we talked about the two variables, let's go through our periodic trends. The trends that we're going to talk about are shielding effect, atomic radius, and ionic radius, so the radius of an ion, ionization energy, and electronegativity. So these are all physical and chemical properties of atoms. Let's first talk about shielding effect. Shielding effect is a decrease of attraction between the nucleus and electrons because of the presence of energy shells, the energy levels. So as you go left to right across a period, shielding stays the same. Why? Because the main energy level stays the same. You're in the same period, therefore you have the same amount of quote unquote shields. As you move down the group, shielding increases. Why? Because what happens as you go down the group? You're gaining, you're, you're increasing the amount of main energy levels. And so if you're increasing the amount of energy levels, you're adding one more shield and that will decrease the attractive force the nucleus has on its valence electrons. So let's take a look at some practice problems. Which element has more shielding? So you want to find both of these elements, sodium and cesium on your periodic table and so we have sodium here and cesium here. Which one has more shielding? Cesium has more shielding because it is on the sixth energy level versus the third energy level. So it has six quote unquote shields as opposed to three. Which element has more shielding? Carbon or oxygen? Well, they're the same. Why? Because they're on the same period. Place these in order from greatest to least shielding. Bismuth, bismuth, phosphorus, and arsenic. Bismuth has the greatest shielding and phosphorus has the least. The second trend we're gonna talk about or the second uh, property, physical property we're gonna talk about is atomic radius. The atomic radius is basically the size of an atom. It is the measure of the distance between the radii of two identical atoms of an element, and that's how we get the atomic radius, the size of an atom. Now going down a group, size increases. Why? Because as you go down a group, what's happening? You're creating more distance as you add more energy levels. So the size increases. And if you take a look, hydrogen, where it has one energy level, sodium, one, two, three, cesium, one, two, three, four, five, six. You can see that when I just draw the energy levels or, or the energy rings or energy shells, you can see that it's obviously getting bigger. Moving left to right across a period, atomic radius decreases. Now this is caused by the increasing nuclear charge. Remember we talked about how if you add more protons, what's happening to the charge in the nucleus? It's getting stronger, it's getting a stronger positive charge. 
So what is happening as it is as the nucleus is getting a stronger positive charge? Well, think about the force of attraction on its electrons. It's pooling those electrons, and as the number of protons increase, the pull on those electrons are going to get stronger and stronger. So even though it's not obviously different, as it pulls on those electrons, it's actually bringing the electrons a little bit closer to the nucleus. So, for example, lithium has three protons, whereas oxygen has six protons and six electrons. So because they're on the same energy level, and the only difference here is that you're increasing the number of protons and also increasing the number of electrons, the six protons are going to have a stronger positive charge than the three protons on lithium. And so the attraction for its valence electrons is going to be greater than the one that lithium has for its electron. And so the stronger the positive charge, the more it's pulling on its valence electrons and it's not going to be that significant. However, again, it's going to pull in the electrons a little bit closer than what lithium is doing to its valence electrons. And so if you take a look at this picture here, it's showing you the general trend. To help you remember this trend, you can draw a snowman on your picture. When you build a snowman, you start with a small head, and then you get bigger as you go down, just like that. Every group on the periodic table will, sh will um, show that trend. And imagine that the um, snowman fell over to the right and it always falls over to the right. So every period shows that the uh, size is getting smaller and smaller. So I'll show you how to use the snowman for those of you who like to use that with these examples here. Which one is bigger, sodium or potassium? So let's first find the two elements, sodium and potassium. They're right above each other. And so I'm going to quickly draw or imagine the snowman, and then I can see that potassium is clearly bigger than sodium. What about sodium or magnesium? Sodium and magnesium are right next to each other. So I draw the snowman falling down, and we can see that sodium is bigger than magnesium. Which one is smaller, phosphorus or chlorine? So these are side by side. So again, imagine the snowman falling down. Chlorine is smaller than phosphorus. Next, let's talk about the size of isoelectronic atoms. So remember what isoelectronic means. We're basically talking about ions, both cations and anions. So these are atoms that have lost or gained the electrons. And let's take a look at what's going to happen to the size of these ions. Cations will be smaller than their parent atoms, meaning their neutral atoms. The formation of a cation involves the loss of the outer shell. So for example, if we're talking about lithium, lithium has one, two, three electrons. And if we're talking about the lithium ion, remember that the lithium ion has a one plus charge. And when it loses that electron, remember that this valence electron will go away. And so what happens after that is now you're left with just the first energy shell with the two valence electrons. The lithium ion would look like this. And that also applies to the rest of the cations. Let's take a look at anions. Anions are larger than their parent atoms. So here, they're not going to lose an energy level or an energy shell. They're also not gaining an energy shell. What happens here is when they gain electrons, and I'll use nitrogen as an example. When nitrogen gains the three electrons, it fills its octet. Now remember that electrons are negatively charged. So what's going to happen if you put more electrons on the same level? They're going to repel each other and there's going to be a little bit of push and shove, right? And so as these electrons push each other, repel each other, the energy level that they're on will also expand a little bit. So that's why the anions are larger 
than the neutral parent atoms. Now for both cations and anions, as you go down a group, the size will increase. And this is mainly because you're adding more energy levels as you go down the periodic table. And in general, the ionic radii will decrease as you go across a period because of the increase in the force of attraction on its electrons. So if you take a look at this picture and you have to look at it separately, the cations here and the anions here, in general for both, as you go down, the size increases. And as you go across, in general, the size decreases. So let's take a look at this practice problem. Let's place the following in order of increasing size. The phosphorus ion, the sulfur ion, and the chlorine ion. Where do you start? You actually need to take a look at the number of protons and the number of electrons. So go ahead and take some time to do that. So I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, but all of these have 18 electrons, right? So then take a look at the number of protons. How many protons do each of these have? Well, phosphorus has 15 protons, sulfur has 16 protons, and chlorine has 17 protons. Well, what's going to be the determining factor here of putting it in order of increasing size? It's obviously not distance. So isn't it the force of attraction? And remember the relationship between the number of protons and the force of attraction? As you increase the number of protons, then the force of attraction also increases, right? A direct relationship. And then think about, well then, if you have a stronger force of attraction on its electrons, what is it going to do to the size? Remember I said that if it has a stronger force of attraction because it has more protons, it's going to pull the electrons a little bit closer to the nucleus, hence the smaller size. So which one will have the smallest radius? The chloride ion and then the phosphorus ion will have the biggest radius. Next, let's take a look at ionization energy. This is a chemical property of atoms. Ionization energy is the energy required to remove an electron from a gaseous atom or ion. Ionization energy decreases down a group because the increase in the force of attraction is largely offset by the distance. Therefore, less energy is required to remove its valence electrons. Now if you think about it, if a valence electron is far away from the nucleus, that force of attraction is weak, right? And so in order to lose that electron, to lose that valence electron, it's not going to take much energy at all. Now when you go across a period, ionization energy increases because of the increasing force of attraction the nucleus has on its electrons, valence electrons. A high ionization energy value indicates a strong hold of the atom on its electrons. It's not going to want to let its electrons go. So take a look at this picture here. This is of magnesium and this is showing you the ionization energy, the amount of energy it takes to remove an electron from a magnesium atom. Now remember that magnesium has two valence electrons. It will gladly get rid of those two valence electrons. So if you take a look at this picture, you see I1, I2, I3. I1 represents the first ionization energy, and you can see that it doesn't take much energy at all to remove that first valence electron. I2 is the second ionization energy, and again, not that much energy is needed to remove that second valence electron. Remember, magnesium will gladly give away the two valence electrons, right, in order to get a full octet. Now take a look at the last one, highlighted in red. I3, that represents the third ionization energy. Look at the big jump. 
it went from 1,445 kilojoules per mole, whereas I3 jumps to 7,000. It doesn't want to let any more electrons go. Can you force it? Yes, you can. But it doesn't want to look at how much energy it takes. Remember that the core inner electrons are going to be held more tightly than the valence electrons. So let's take a look at this example. Which of the following ground state electron configurations represents the atom that has the highest first ionization energy? Meaning, which one will require the highest amount of energy to remove that electron? You can take a second and find these four different elements on your periodic table, or you can simply answer this question by looking at the electron configuration. If you said B, you are correct. C and D are the configurations of potassium and calcium. Both of these elements have four main energy levels, so they are further away from the nucleus, and they also tend to be cations, right? And so they will gladly lose those one or two valence electrons. It's not gonna take much energy at all to remove those electrons. Whereas A and B, those are uh, phosphorus and sulfur, First of all, they have less distance, three main energy levels. But between, but between the two, sulfur has a stronger nuclear charge by having one more proton than phosphorus. So it's really holding on to those valence electrons. So it's going to take a lot more energy to remove the electron from sulfur than from phosphorus, right? But we know that the nonmetals, they tend to gain the electrons, they don't want to lose the electrons. So both phosphorus and sulfur will have higher ionization energies. However, sulfur is the one that will have a higher ionization energy value. Now this goes hand in hand with reactivity, and we'll talk about the reactivity of the alkali metals. Going down the group, the reactivity of alkali metals increases. So it goes from least reactive at lithium to most reactive for cesium. And if you want to take a look at the video, you can take a look. You can click on the link in the um, description box below. And, it, and you can see how the elements, as you go down the group, it goes from least reactive to most reactive. So why does it get more reactive as you go down? because it has a lower ionization energy value. It is so much easier to strip that electron away from the atom. Less energy is required to remove that valence electron. So the easier it is to remove that valence electron, the more violent the reaction is going to be. So if you take a look here, you can see that helium has the highest ionization energy value because first of all, the, the nuclear charge is greatest, right? It only has two protons in the nucleus and it only it has one energy level with this electrons there. So it's really holding on to those electrons. It's not going to let those electrons go. And as you go down, you can see that the ionization energy value decreases. So again, the higher the value, the more it's going to hold on to those electrons. It's not going to want to let those electrons go. So if you take a look at this picture or this table, you can see that your nonmetals are the ones that have the highest ionization energy values compared to your metals. Doesn't that make sense? We talked about how metals tend to be your cations. It wants to get rid of those valence electrons to get to a stable state, to get to that octet, as opposed to nonmetals. They want to gain the electrons in order to get to the octet. They don't want to lose the electrons that they already have. To help you remember the trend for ionization energy, you can think of an ice cream cone. So in those previous slides, you saw that I abbreviated with IE to stand for ionization energy. So you can think of IE ice cream cone, bigger on top, gets smaller as you go down. And then the ice cream cone falls over to the right and it always falls over to the right. And so you can see that it goes from decreasing to increasing order. So which element has a higher ionization energy value? 
magnesium, or cal calcium. So first of all, find the two elements. You can draw your ice cream cone. And you can, you can see that magnesium has the higher value. Which one has the higher value, aluminum or sulfur? Aluminum here, sulfur here. You can, you can also answer this question by remembering that your nonmetals are the ones that have the higher ionization energy values compared to your metals, so sulfur is the answer there. And then place it in order of decreasing ionization energy, lead, cesium, and acetine. So cesium, lead, and acetine, put it in order of decreasing ionization energy. So we start with acetine and you go down to cesium. The last periodic trend we're gonna talk about is electronegativity. Electronegativity is the measure of attraction an atom has for electrons in a chemical bond. In a chemical bond, the atom with the greater electronegativity value more strongly attracts the bond's electrons. So this is when the electrons are being shared between two atoms. So imagine a tug of war where there are two sides that are holding onto that rope and they're not going to let go. And that's basically what the atoms look like when they're sharing electrons and more on that on the in the next unit. So who wants a tug of war game? It's the one who is stronger, right? And you have flags in the middle of the rope and the stronger side or the stronger person will will pull on the rope and the flags will go to his or her side and that's how you win the game. So that's basically what this looks like when we talk about electronegativity. Electronegativity decreases as you go down a group. And again, this has to do with distance. So the uh, nucleus has a weaker force of attraction for its valence electrons. And then electronegativity increases as you go to the right again, because of the increasing force of attraction. So this is a chart of electronegativity values. To help you remember this, you can also think of the ice cream cone. So in the same way for ionization energy, as you go down, the values decrease, and then as you go across, the values increase. So there's your ice cream cone. And if you look at this chart, what family is missing? The noble gases are missing, right? That's the difference here between um, ionization energy and electronegativity. Noble gases don't have an electronegativity value because first of all, it has a full octet, right? It's not going to want to share its electrons with anything. They don't want to bond with anything. So they don't have an electronegativity value. Whereas ionization energy, they do, noble gases do have an ionization energy value because it doesn't want to get rid of its electrons. And so in order to remove an electron for a noble gas, it's going to take a lot of energy to strip that electron away. So which element is more electronegative, fluorine or chlorine? So again, you can draw the ice cream cone and you can see that fluorine is more electronegative. In fact, it's the most electronegative element on our periodic table. Which element is more electronegative, sodium or potassium? And we have sodium. Which, one, which element is more electronegative, tin or iodine? And there you have iodine. And so to conclude, when we looked at all of these periodic trends, we really focused on just the two variables, force of attraction and distance. Make sure that you familiarize yourself with those two variables and are able to explain these trends using those variables. Don't forget to also review your nuclear charge. Remember that as you increase the number of protons, the nuclear charge also increases. Therefore, the force of attraction between the nucleus and the valence electrons will also increase.